Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podserve, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. How does a guy bring over 150 years of experience to the business table as a consultant, speaker, and author? Larry Mandelberg explains in his book, Businesses Don't Fail, They Commit Suicide, How to Survive, Success, and Thrive in Good Times and Bad. So are you still in business or are you just sharing everything you've learned at this point? It's a good question. Um, Technically, I'm what they call semi-retired, which means um, I, I still work. I still do what I've what I've been doing for a long time, but, um, I don't do it constantly. And, um, my thing is I'm very picky about who I work with and I have the luxury of being able to say, you know, we both have to make a decision as to whether you're going to hire me. This is not about me asking you to hire me. This is about, do I want to work for you or not? And do you want me to work for you? And what that work is, is I work with successful companies who are causing their success causes them to face changes and challenges and don't know how to deal with that. So I've got great clients and and everything I do is project based. I don't do anything, you know, pay me 2000 a month, 5,000 a month, whatever. I don't do that. Everything is here's a project. Here's the cost. Here's how long it'll take. Let's do it, get it done and move on. It, It doesn't matter the industry, the legal structure, or um, the revenue, it, it just just doesn't matter because I deal with leadership. What matters is that there needs to be multiple layers of management. In other words, you know, small companies, everybody reports to one person. Right. I have value to those people, but it's limited. That's not my target. I don't do retail. So no primary sources of revenue from retail activities. They need to... Um, have a desire to be sustainable, right? They have they have to want the business to be strong enough for the organization so that when leadership leaves, new leadership can come in and continue the journey. Like there's a small a family owned business that's pretty huge, but they don't give a shit. You know? The kids don't want to take it over and they don't care. So they're just gonna get as much money out of it as they can and move on. Mm-hmm. And then the the fourth thing is they have to be autonomous. They have to be able to make decisions that are based on the best interest of the business uh, as opposed to outside investors. Because when you have outside investors, you've got things like return on investment and mm-hmm. you know, dividends, et cetera, et cetera. And then people make stupid decisions because they need to take care of their shareholders. So I, you know, I've done three pretty good sized contracts for, for um, Fortune 50 companies, but again, it's it's focuses on a singular skill that I have, as opposed to the cumulative knowledge that I sell and market, which is fine with me. You know, I don't care. It pays just the same. Businesses don't fail; they commit suicide. Yeah. Is the name of your book. Yeah. Are, are these the examples that you've just given me? Is this what I'm going to find in your book? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the first three chapters are how I came up with this idea. Um, the first chapter is the how I the, the question that drove me. Why do businesses fail? And I explain all of that. And then the second chapter was. So so there's a thing called a a hypothesis, a construct, and a theory. A hypothesis is what you do when you think you know something, but you're not sure, and you need to test it. You need the construct as a framework to test the hypothesis. And once you have tested the hypothesis using the construct, you can create a theory, which is theoretically valid and then you do what's called proof of concept to try and break the theory make the theory wrong and you do that for a period of time that's statistically defined by 
industry standards around statistics and probability. And once you do that enough and you, you don't fail, the goal is to, to make the theory fail, you have a viable theory that you can go and apply. So chapter two is about the hypothesis and the construct, and chapter three is about the theory, and there are eight components to it. And uh, well, there's there's three segments, and within those three segments, there are eight additional smaller pieces. And um, then the last chapter is how you put it all together. And it's a how-to book. Um, it's designed to tell everybody everything that I learned and help them understand how I got to my theory, because that's important if you want to have people to believe it. And nobody needs me if they buy that book. It's a kind of a how-to book. If people need help, I can help them. And if people want me to do it with them, I don't do it for them, then they can hire me. Um, I developed uh, an assessment tool, which is really fast and really simple. It's, it's really kind of amazing. I did this in the 90s, and I call it the Business Manager's Reality Index. And it measures the eight core elements of a business by relative strength. And those things, when I say core elements of a business, they're the core elements that allow you to create sustainable, profitable growth. So having those eight or the absence of them become leading indicators, leading non-financial indicators. People think financial indicators are leading. They're not. There's no such thing as a leading financial indicator. They're all lagging. So my, my complicated line is I can measure the capacity of your organization to create sustainable, profitable growth using leading non-financial indicators. So it ranks those eight things in relative strength. And then what you do is you say, if you want your business to be sustainable, you go to one of the three weakest and fix it, make it strong. And the minute you do that, your life is going to get measurably easier. Can you give me an example of that? So so let me let me answer that in a little roundabout way. Okay. This is all the construct is all built on the concept of corporate life cycle theory, which is the study how of how corporations grow and die. And it's shockingly accurate because it's they're all made up of people and they all age and deteriorate just like people do. It's very predictable. So what I found was that organizations live in one of three levels or states of maturity, youth, adolescence, and adulthood. And there are three elements of youth, three elements of adolescence, and two elements of adulthood. That's the eight. And every organization that's in youth fails because of a lack of clarity of purpose. Every organization in adolescence fails because of a lack of consistency of performance. Adolescence, performance. Adulthood, people. But it's engagement of people. So Sears, you know Sears, right? Sure. So Sears is an adult organization. They failed because of a lack of engagement of people. The, the industry they served moved, and the organization, the leadership of the organization wasn't sufficiently connected through its staff to its customer to be able to adapt to the industry it was serving. You look at McDonald's, they're the, you know, they're the classic example. They are in adulthood, but they were able to get there because they, A, they understood what their purpose was, and B, they were able to deliver consistently. It has nothing to do with quality, nothing. It's about setting expectations and fulfilling those expectations. So one of the examples is I was hired, and I said before, it doesn't matter what the legal structure is, meaning not-for-profit, or profit or government, public sector. Right. So I've used this in all three, and one of the fun stories is there was a congressman from California who had three offices. Because of his territory is in the Central Valley, so he had one at the north end, one at the south end, and one in D.C., 
and they were constantly struggling to try to get things done and to communicate effectively and to work hand in hand and to be collaborative and to actually, you know, execute the way this, the congressman wanted. And they hired me. And what they had done was they had not completed clarity of purpose, but acting like they were adolescent. What we did was we went in and clarified their purpose. And the real core for that was how they deliver value to their constituency. That's where they were missing. So, so one of the three components of, of purpose is the value you deliver, the manner in which you deliver it, and the audience you deliver it to. So they knew the audience and they knew the value, but they didn't know how, they didn't have across the three offices, they didn't, uh, they didn't see the manner of delivery the same. So they were trying to act in as if they were adolescent and deliver consistent performance and they were unable to do so because they could, hadn't gotten alignment on purpose. So we closed that loop and and that was the weakest of the eight indicators. And then literally everything else just fall, fell into place. Now, one of the benefits of my system is it sequences them in order of importance or priority. And that gave them the ability to say, I'm gonna, okay, now I got one thing to focus on. Let's deal with that. Now I got the next thing to, instead of trying to deal with five things at once. Right, 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 right. It just makes so much sense. It sounds like common sense, doesn't it? It does. To me, it does. But then again, I, I've been living this stuff my whole life. I'm fifth generation in a family-owned business that started in the 1850s in hides and furs. What? Yeah. Something else, yeah. What, what I like to say is that I have 170 years of experience. <laughs> As a non-recovering, I believe entrepreneurship is... A, a disease, a non-fatal, non-curable disease that has to be managed, like all non-fatal, non-curable diseases. Okay. And I've never, <laughs> other than two gigs in college, I've never worked for a company I didn't own. So I come at this from a from a rather uncommon perspective. And um, yeah, to me, it seems very simple. I, I love the business of doing business. And so my vision, which is this is all linked, I believe my vision, my purpose on this planet, in my opinion, in my belief, in my heart, is to teach or to help my market, the business owners that fit my demographic. And I say business, but it could be government, public sector right, nonprofit or profit, it, the legal structure is not relevant, is everybody that wants a job has one and loves it, and every employer that has employees loves them and treats them properly, and mm -hmm. I call it the no help wanted model, because I want help wanted ads to be as, as common as 33 LPs, they don't exist <laughs> and the way you do that is you build an organization the way I talk about. Right. So my passion is getting that out and sharing the knowledge with people. Like, you know, there's an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him think. <laughs> and I don't, so true. Yeah. And, and I don't want to change anybody's opinion or browbeat anybody or, you know, I tell people this all the time. I talk as if I'm God and I am have the absolute unequivocal truth. But that's not right. It's just one guy with one opinion. And you've got to make a decision as to whether you agree with me or not. And if you do, listen to me. And if you don't, don't. Okay. And um, all I want to do is present that to people. And if they like it and want to follow it, Great. And if they don't, so be it. Hold on. How I, I would I would imagine you get a lot of business through word of mouth. People that have hired you and been successful with you and say, hey, you know. Yeah, um, actually, that's close. Not quite. 
I okay. get all my business through word of mouth. Yeah. I don't do any advertising or marketing. I do a newsletter and it's a monthly newsletter. And I'm very proud of the fact that for in the consulting industry, the industry standard for opens, you know what I mean by that? Opens as in when you open the newsletter? Yeah, because you can measure that. You email the newsletter, and if nobody opens it, you know that. So the industry standard for opens in the management consulting industry is 12 to 13%. Okay. Mine average 35 to 40%. That's amazing. And I have just under 1,400 active readers. So now you have a handbook for all of these active readers. Well, and more. Yeah. These people have been listening to me for decades. Right. Um, but I'm trying to get it out to a broader audience. Okay. I mean, for example, I've gone to ex-employees, colleagues, and clients, both active and no longer, and told them about the book and helped ask them to help me promote it. Um, I'm doing podcasts. I'm doing interviews. I'm doing speaking gigs. I'm using my newsletter, I'm, you know, I'm doing, you know, you can't do, in this world, you can't do one thing. I know. You have to figure out who your market is, and you have to talk to them in their language. I call that tribal lingo. And I do throw people off a little bit because everybody wants you to have an industry you focus on. And I just don't. Um, because right. I'm dealing with leadership. And when you're in leadership, you've got basically one common shared goal, right? Achieve, you know, make sure the organization fulfills its purpose, right? That's really all there is to it. And um, I talk about things like what a well-conceived organization is, how you define a well-conceived organization. Um, I talk about why. Money is never the cause of failure. A lock, la, lack of money. My dad had a saying that I absolutely loved. He used to, and and it took me until I got older before I really could understand it. He used to say, "No business ever went broke with money in the bank." And I, I would say, "Well, of course not. That's a stupid thing to say." <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that. When people say, and, and when I was doing my research, this is a long time ago, 23 years of primary research and eight years of proof of concept, a long time ago, uh, with a statistically valid sampling, over 100 companies and 250 executives in the top three tiers of management. And, you know, from that, I extracted data and built my theory. Right. This is all driven by the hypothesis. And I would talk to people. I, I would say, you know, what are you the most afraid of? What is your fear? What do you think is going to cause you to go out of business? Blah, 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 blah. Trying to get to what they were worried about it was always money. Yeah. You don't have enough money. Well, that's just bull. There's more money in this world than anybody needs by like tenfold. And if you don't know how to find it, shame on you. Find somebody, hire somebody. Or. or buy your book or, or buy my book. Yeah. <laughs> well, but my book doesn't talk about how to get money. That's a whole nother thing, but it's, it's not hard to do. And the problem with money being the cause of business failure is that money is always a lagging indicator, right? Right. You can't measure money tomorrow. You can only measure it after it happens today, which makes money the lagging indicator of a bad decision. And once the decision's been made, if it's bad enough and can't be corrected, the organization fails. But money's never the reason. Larry, I could talk to you all day. I, I mean, I have experiences with nonprofits and trying to convince people, like, all we have to do here, people, is get on the same page. Let's just get on the same page. Like you said, alignment, being aligned right. with your goals, your purpose, your mission statement. And yeah. it is surprisingly frightening at how difficult that can be. So I wish you the best of luck with your book. And if you're ever in New York, let me know. Well, you have my email, don't you? I do. <clears throat> I have your email. I have your number. I have everything, Larry. Well, make me look good.
All right. <laughs> you look great. You have a great speaking voice. You're fine, Larry. You did a great job. <laughs> you have a great day. You too, Alex. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. M. Cortano's career path is for sure the road less traveled. A food company owner outside Chicago who has published his first children's book. It's entitled How Athena Found Her Owl and Other Curiosities. Tell us how you got here. I I think once upon a time, I was a singer-songwriter of some notoriety. I had interviews in the Rolling Stone and whatever. My, My former manager is now one of the many managers of Dave Matthews, if you're familiar with that artist. Uh, yeah. I, so I was out in LA and I was uh, writing for film, trying to get a record deal, whatever. And um, one of the producers I was working with on a film um, said, you know, well, the, the lyrics are good, but they don't really stand up on a page by themselves, do they? Huh. And, <clears throat> and I was saying to myself, well, that's because it's not literature. It's, a song <laughs> right which, which means it's got a music background right mm-hmm. uh so in those circumstances you can say for example the river and depending on what moment of the song that word falls you get everything you need to know about the river whether it's a raging river or a quiet babbling brook or what have you right okay so um i i kind of i left the music industry uh, some time ago, uh, for various reasons. And I, I guess I wanted to prove a point. And so I started writing and I wrote a novel, uh, which no one knows about yet. Um, but it's finished and I have a son, he's 12, but at the time he was, I think in fourth grade, so maybe eight. And I asked him to give me five words and uh, I started to write the story of Athena and how she found her owl. And there's a there's a backstory to that one too, and why that's the why that's the topic of the first children's book. Uh, but I read it as a mystery reader in his school, dressed as a wizard, as the wizard M. Cortano, and uh, you know it was it was well very well received. In fact, the teacher after his teacher after I had um, read the story was in tears saying I always wanted to be an author. And I said, well, you still can, what's stopping you? And so I had the story illustrated by this wonderful French uh, illustrator, Florian Roussel. And then after that came, how Zeus found a helmet. And then the third one, how Festus found a volcano. And so I'm 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 really interested in uh, antiquity and the ancient stories. You know, um, the novel is is set in late antiquity, um, featuring um, the story of Emperor Aurelian, um, who was the last emperor to unify the failing Roman Republic, mm. the Roman Empire. And that leads us to Constantine the Great, right? So, um, so I have I've got this. I'm a huge history fan. I travel for it. Just I won't go any place in the world without good food, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and and historical relevance. So, um, and that that's a that's a whole other story about how. But that I think that sort of explains how I got into writing and and um, I you know I've written poetry and songs and things like that. But I've been I've been a wordsmith since the time I was in my 20s. But my degree is actually in neuroscience. <laughs> Jeez, and you ended up in music, and now, that's so funny. What a what a circuitous right. route you have taken. That's correct, yes. Tell me the backstory of this book. So my son went to an elementary school called Willard Elementary in River Forest, and it's the Willard Wizards, yeah? And, you know, school spirit, they have these T-shirts and so on. And one of the T-shirts is a wizard. And another of the T-shirt is an owl. And I'm a huge owl fan. So um, I studied them in graduate school and so on. <laughs> uh, so um, they're, they're, they're very amazing creatures. So I was trying to get an owl T-shirt for my son. And they're like, well, the owls are for the girls and the wizards are for the boys. And I'm like, well, what's gender specific about an owl? Right. So I'm like, you know, I re- remember Clash of the Titans, if you remember that film. I do. And, yeah. 
uh, that Athena's owl in that movie was a male. And I was just like, well, I'm going to prove that the owl can be a male. And I'll write the story and I will read it to all of the elementary school talking about how owls can be both female and male. And it's not gender specific, although a wizard, of course, is mm -hmm. in any case. Um, so I went about the, the idea of trying to prove the point. And, and I was going through the histories that were written about Athena and her owl. And the truth is that no one knows how Athena um, no one wrote about it uh, contemporaneously, right? We're, you know, we're talking about the, the classics, right? Right. Uh, so no one wrote about it. So it's an unknown, it's really unknown. Um, of course, Athena does get associated with the owl and so on, but it, it's not, not clear exactly what happened and how she became as associated with the owl. So I, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll write the story then. And as I was writing the story, uh, I, it, it, I was really trying to make it a male owl. And while there are male owls in the story, Athena's owl end up being a female, a, a princess. So, and her name is Vaya, and that comes from the Greek word kukuvaya, which means owl, <laughs> right? So it was, I just couldn't get around it. It had to be a female. right? So um, I, I, I ended up spending all that time to prove I was actually wrong and the owl is trying to prove that the t-shirt could be for boys and it's just like i didn't get there well <laughs> so that's the story that's the back man. it's still a good story and a guy can still be an owl i mean come on <laughs> well the king owl via's via's father there you go Lofty, which is an ancient word for owl mm -hmm. <laughs> uh ancient greek word for owl uh is actually a male so and he's very wise right but uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it's interesting that uh, as as the story sort of made a, made its way around the school and family and friends, every, everyone said to me, including an author friend of mine, um, said, look, I like your history. No one's going to ever read that because it's written in seven languages, not including three dialects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you, you, that's just way too heady for people. Right. Um, but um this story about Athena, you need to publish that. And it's interesting to hear the responses because both adults and um, and children get something out of it. And it's it's interesting to hear how adults sort of laugh with it. And and honestly, that was really my intention. My intention of writing the book was to create um, a story that doesn't interfere with the you know the the pantheon as as we know it right right of, of you know, i don't want to i don't want to mislead anybody and tell a story that you can refer to somebody else to get the to get the backstory i mean the the, the writers of the of, of those stories uh, but um it gives an opportunity for parents to sit down with their children and develop an interest in reading and explore different themes and gain an insight into history, which, you know, I'm a fan of and um, start that curiosity about why are things the way they are? Do they have to be right? And, and so, or can we change them or do we understand it? Right. And so that, so, so there's some words in there that are, um, that are a little bit, uh, how shall I say it? Um, they're a stretch for the for the age group that I'm writing for, but that's that's appropriate, and that 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 starts conversations. Yes, it does. There's only four or five words, and that and so now we see now we have an opportunity for the parent to pull the child off of the screen or the phone or whatever it is, and you know sit with them and talk with them and and build an engagement and a rapport and you know an understanding of each other uh, in the context of a magical story. So what is the story? It's it's narrated by M. Cortano. That's important. That's an important point because um, he claims to have been there, and he's not necessarily reliable because he's a kind of a, a, a tricky wizard. But I'm setting something up, and so you can see the, the the trajectory of the stories, right, and where I'm headed with it. So, the goddess Athena has crystal clear vision of the future. So she's always in the right place at the right time. 
she sees all of the possibilities. However, she has no recollection of the past. She has no memory. And that is a very interesting problem for a goddess to have. For example, she only remotely sort of gets that Zeus is her dad. She knows, like she sees into the future and from the future she can sort of work out the past, but she has no memory. So for example, she might uh, be traveling home and she might know the exact best route to go. But when she gets to her home, she has no idea where she's at. That sounds kind of sad. (laughs) It's like a river that, you know, of time that just sort of travels around a bend and disappears from view. Hmm. Okay, so Zeus is really upset by this, her father. He wants to help her. And he devises a way uh, to aid her in her problem. It's really the story about a father helping a daughter remember and the things that he goes through for her uh, to, to set her up to discover the solution for herself. Nice. And she does. And it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a beautiful story. And it's, and there is a little bit of frustration and sadness with Athena, but she recovers and she develops this friendship with her princess owl by a baby owl, who's the smallest of all of the owls. And, um, the, the owl has absolute clarity and memory of the past. So she supports Athena in total omniscience. Wow. You have, you have a beautiful voice, which I'm sure you've been told. You must be something else when you're reading that book. I can just see you putting all of the emotion and the drama. And I mean, you've already done the hardest part for a lot of authors, and that is putting the book out there and reading it in front of your audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, so... So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so th- I think that's what propelled me to the second and third story. So when I finished, when I was done with the first story and I started the second one with the same sort of parameters, give me five words and I'll, I'll weave them into a story. And um, I walked into the, uh, to the classroom. Remember the first time I, I was dressed as a wizard. Right. Right. Okay. So my son was really just, upset by that because everyone thought I was the mascot of the school. <laughs> he's like, you're, so he's like, you can't wear the wizard costume because every, everyone's, it's really, it's just really upsetting. And I said, Oh, am I embarrassing you? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You ought not have said that. I went to read the second story and I didn't have my wizard costume on, but I did put my wizard's hat in my bag. And I walked into this, I walked into the classroom and they're like, all the students were really just disappointed that I didn't come dressed as the wizard. (laughs) And I said, well, listen, I said, um, Andreas has a problem. He thinks you think I'm the school's mascot and I'm not (laughs) Be clear about that. But I did bring my wizard's hat. And if Andreas puts the hat on me, that's my son's name, Andreas. If he puts the hat on me, then I'll, 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 I'll wear it. And he ended up putting the hat on me and I read the second story. But when I walked into the room, I was like, does everybody remember how Athena found her owl? And everyone, all the kids were just screaming out like moments of that story and telling the story back to me. And I'm like, okay, great. Now, this is how Zeus found a helmet. And that's the second story. So his solution, uh, Zeus' solution was to get, to get her a helmet, which would lead her to the owl. And if, you, if you're familiar with the iconography of Athena, she's all often depicted wearing a helmet. And so I'm weaving in, I'm trying to tie these elements together, right, and create a richer story. Well, you are certainly on your way to something pretty special, I think, here. Huh, I hope so. It's actually being translated now into Greek. Wow. Uh, which I think is great. Um, and then we'll see, you know, we'll see how that lays out. Um, I know that, you know, I went through the coffee house. I like, as you said, I've already done the hard work, right? I've got three children's stories fully illustrated, plus a novel that's a heavy lift, right? Okay, I've done the hard work. That that novel took me ten years to write. Okay, so okay, now 
it's the, kind of like the coffee houses. I, I did the hard work. I wrote the songs, I performed the songs, I mastered my instrument, and so on and so forth, right? But I wouldn't have gotten to where I where I ended up like with a a, a, a tour that took me from you know New York uh, to LA through Texas and and so on. I I did all of that right without a manager, without an agent, somebody to somebody to put it together. You know, if I'm spending time doing that, you know, and I'm not spending time doing writing, <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, the most successful people that I've talked to start where they are. I mean, you've already started in your kid's school. There's the library. There's reading programs for children. Just wherever you are, whatever it's easiest for you to get to, that's where you need to go. You know what I mean? I No, I, I, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. You start local and you build from there, right? And you know, uh, you know how you get better gigs? You get better gigs. I I, I remember, I remember like when I was playing, when I was playing uh, the coffee houses and the, and the open mics and stuff like that, I'd pick up three or four people, three or four new fans every time I performed. It wasn't the, wasn't the house, it was three or four. That's it. And then I'd go from one open mic to the next open mic to the next. After 30 open mics, I was selling out a small venue, right? Right. I get it. So maybe the answer for you is to hire someone because you're so busy running a company Somebody to help you find venues where you can perform your books, bring your hat, and uh, see what happens. I mean, you are near a major city. There's there's something out there somewhere, I believe. <laughs> All right. Let me know how you make out. Listen, it was so nice to talk to you. You bet. Nice to meet you, too. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.